So I'm going to talk a bit about um, this, that sort of case study of what we did to kind of improve our test coverage, what we did to improve the quality of our tests, and um, hopefully maybe there will be some things that we can, uh, that everyone can learn from this particular experience. I assume everyone here is doing some sort of automated testing running in CR, I guess. Most people, some people are like, no, 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 okay. Uh, our, hmm, what's the next question? Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, so, we actually had automated tests for the MongoDB Java driver, but we, which is good, because I've got lots of places where we didn't have automated tests. What I really wanted, as I said, was to understand what these tests were doing, so that when we did a big rewrite of the driver, if the test broke, we would understand much better why they were breaking, if the test was supposed to break, if the code was supposed to be changed, and so on and so forth. One of the things that helped us with this is moving to a framework called Spock, which is written in Ruby. Um, does anyone know Spock? Anyone using Spock? Okay, one person. <laughs> That's good. This is not a talk about um, how using Spock is going to fix all of your problems, because presumably people here are not even necessarily coding on JVM. In which case, me giving you a talk about how amazing Spock is, is not going to be particularly useful for you. So, this is not going to be about how Spock will fix all your problems. However, this talk is about how we identify the problems we had with our existing automated tests, the things we wanted to improve, and how some things, including the choice of a new framework, address those particular problems. The main question that I want to answer is, how do we encourage ourselves as a team to write tests? Because um, it's not always automatically to write automated tests. More importantly, how do we write tests that are readable enough that everyone in the team can kind of understand them? So for me, the most important thing here was when the test starts failing, which it inevitably will do, I need to understand why it's failing and what the test was supposed to be doing. And lastly, probably most, the most difficult thing to fix is how do we make sure these are meaningful tests? I can write tests that go green, but that's actually not that difficult. How do I write the right sort of test, which is, writing the, which is testing the correct sort of thing? How do I make sure these tests are valuable? I'd rather have you know, test coverage of 50% of very valuable tests than 90% of all tests for getting and constructors and so forth. So let's look at the first one of those items, if you like. Why do we as developers generally not write tests quite as often as perhaps we ought to? Hands up if you're a developer. Oh, that's great. That's a bit worried about managers going, of course all my developers write tests. Hands up if you automatically always want to write tests. Right, so 
So it would be, it's too much of a time investment to automate my tests than to fix up any problems with my car. Uh, yes, so let's put this one. That is number six. Not enough time, effectively. Yes. It's hard to write tests. I need to build a framework. My code might not have been written in a way which is so easy to test. And so there's a big upfront investment. So, uh, yes. That is number one reason. It's too hard to set up. I need a framework, I need a library, or I've got layers of code, or something like that. It's very difficult to get started with tests. Any other reasons? Yeah. Our code is not complicated enough. Absolutely. The code is simple. The code is self-documenting. Um, and tests obviously help with maintainability. If my code is kind of simple and maintainable, I don't actually need to write tests for that. There was another one over here. No. Okay. So the other, the other very good reasons or possibly excuses that were uh, mentioned was um, too hard to mock, which is a similar thing to the framework thing. It's too difficult for me to add mocks. I've got a lot of singletons, or I have this big legacy mass, or it's UI code, or it's Android code, for example. They're very difficult to mock a lot of those things. Um, I, uh, yeah, UI code. That was a class of its own. It's the user interface. I can't automate the tests for that. I do not believe you. It's hard, but it's not impossible. Effort versus value. So it's a little bit like this. Um, it, not enough time. But it's not just a case of I'm not allowed to, my bosses say I don't have time. It's also a case of, like you said, the amount of time and effort I need to put into creating my automated tests is much higher than the amount of value I'm going to get out of having them fail intermittently or whatever. And uh, number eight was uh, I'm the only developer. I don't need to write tests. I'm the only developer. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I have the memory of a goldfish. So I like to write tests for my code, and I like to put comments in occasionally, because I will come to that code in a week's time and go, what idiot wrote this? Oh, it was me. Never mind. So we have a lot of extremely good reasons as to, as to why we don't write tests. And often, they're very well-meaning, like um, single-use code, I'm going to throw it away, I don't need to test it. Have you ever worked on a prototype which made it into production? That's about a third of you. They made it into production and stayed there for longer than a year. The same number of people. <laughs> the single-use throwaway code is, is, you can't rely on that. Um, so there are lots of great reasons, lots of great excuses for why we don't write tests. So let's take a step back and say, OK, fine. So why should we write tests? What are tests for? Now, this is easy. Tests are there to make sure the code you wrote works. Now, when you look at things this way, you start to realize why sometimes it's very easy for us as developers to say, I don't need to write tests. I tested it manually, it works. I wrote the code, I know it works. It's too simple, it works. So writing a set of automated tests to ensure that it works sometimes feels a bit like double effort, like it's not really, it's not worth the effort. But in actual fact, we can take a step further back and say, what are tests good for? Not just why should we write them, but what other benefits can they give us? In which case, there's kind of a number of different things. I hope you can read this. I know it's a bit small at the back there. Obviously, testing is good for ensuring the quality of your code. We all know that. That's why we're supposed to write tests. Um, testing is good for maintainability. So for finding um, regression things that you might accidentally put in, for when you're trying to fix a bug or change an area later on in the future, you can read the test to figure out what that code is supposed to do or what we thought it was supposed to do. You know, the ongoing maintenance tests are great for that sort of thing. Um, design. Sandro's talk earlier about using TDD to drive app design. Um, not everyone is sold on TDD, but it can, doing TDD or doing, or making your code more testable can clean up your design because you're working with the code. You're trying to figure out how do I use this? What are the dependencies? How does it interact with the rest of the system? So testing can help you with your design. Reliability. If your tests, if you have intermittent tests, that can be a sign either that your tests aren't that fantastic or that maybe your code 
is not always amazingly reliable. I worked on, um, on a financial exchange where we had a number of intermittent tests because we had an asynchronous system and there's always timeouts and so on and so forth. And sometimes that is a, a feature of the tests. And sometimes it can lead you to see if there's race conditions or unusual circumstances happening in your code base. So if your tests are always passing, it gives you a much warmer and fuzzier feeling about your reliability. It can certainly be an indicator of how reliable your code is or maybe how reliable your tests are. Um, documentation. I know people are kind of split on whether tests are documentation or not. Um, I believe that if you have no documentation and have no tests, then you're probably not uh, helping your future developers very often, very much. Um, I'm not saying, when I was working on the MongoDB Java driver, of course we had Java doc documentation, tutorials and things like that. But we would also have our unit tests and our acceptance tests to sort of document, under these circumstances, I expect to see this kind of behavior. And those tests are useful for not only documenting that behavior, but ensuring that that behavior continues to work at time and time again, every time you run it in CI. And usability. Now, not necessarily for um, a UI usability point of view, although perhaps if you are doing, um, using something like Selenium to drive your UI, maybe you will find that I need to, um, I need to script together something which is 15 clicks to place an order, which I do a lot, and perhaps that might be a usability fail. I'm talking more about the fact that if you're using tests to test like an API, for example, if you do have library code, or if you do have an API that you're exposing to other systems, when you're coding against that API in the tests, you can see that perhaps um, passing in 15 parameters, some of which are like four different flavors of Booleans, is not quite as usable to, to a Java developer or another developer. So writing the tests against the API, writing the tests against your classes, can also help you see how usable those things are for other developers. So testing is not just about making sure that the code you wrote works. Testing has a bunch of other side effects which are quite useful as well. So how can we change the attitudes of the developers around us who might not be as sold on testing as perhaps we are? Well, in actual fact, perhaps we don't need to have them as sold on testing as we are. Perhaps we don't need to make everyone in our team an evangelist for pure TDD where everything is amazing and wonderful like the people who stand up and talk at these conferences. We don't necessarily have to sell people on feeling intrinsically like this is the right thing to do. What we do need to do though is perhaps lead to general change in behavior of the team. How do we re reward the sorts of behaviors we want to see? How do we get people to write more tests? How do we get people to value the readability of the tests? How do we get people to start to understand that the tests need to be more, my eyes are going dark. <laughs> How do we get people to understand what it means to write a test which is meaningful? Um, we can change that sort of behavior without necessarily getting everyone to think TDD is the way forward and we're definitely going to do it in this kind of religious manner, if you like. One of the things we can do to try and steer the behavior of the team is to have a champion for the sorts of behaviors that we want to encourage. Um, in this case, I guess for the MongoDB Java driver, I ended up being the de facto champion because I was the one who kept banging on about we should probably have more tests, mostly because I was kind of fairly new to the project. And I'd come from this um, very well-tested financial exchange a financial exchange, so it should be very well tested. And I was kind of used to having the security of having all these automated tests so that I could refactor things when I wanted to and know that I hadn't broken anything. If we're going to rewrite the driver, I want to again have that security that I can refactor things and redesign things and re-architect things and know that I haven't broken something fundamental. So it kind of became my job to keep kind of banging on about we should probably have better tests to make sure that this happens. Now, I assume, because you guys are in this talk, that you guys will be that sort of champion. And the champion doesn't have to be someone in a very senior position or someone with a lot of power. If you're doing things like pair programming or code reviews, it can be any member of the team sort of saying, where are your tests? What does this test mean? I don't really understand what you meant when you wrote this in your test. This is something I did at LMAX. I was kind of fairly junior there. And um, 
but I saw that our tests were fairly intermittent. So I kept sort of saying, why are these failing? Is this a real failure? Is this not a failure? And kind of pushed us towards much more reliability in our uh, acceptance tests. So much so that they wrote an automated tool that they called AutoTrish to replace me to do that stuff. Which is good, right? You want to be replaceable. You don't want to keep banging on about these things again and again and again. It's extremely tiring. But if you are trying to move the team in a particular direction, you do need at least one person who cares enough to shift the team in that direction. Over time, with the sorts of behavior that the champion is displaying, for example, asking time and again in code reviews, where are your tests? For example, um, asking what does this mean? Quality can become a habit. But you, you know for a start that you, you don't, you're not going to even get past the first stage of code review unless you have a bunch of tests. One of the things I had done is put in place things like CheckStyle and PMD and all these static analysis tools. And the team just got used to the fact that um, the boring stuff that we used to check in code reviews, like your tabs versus spaces and your curly braces and all the rest of that nonsense, is all automated. And we don't check that in code reviews anymore. We start looking at the quality. What could go wrong with this? Where are the missing tests? What, um, what does this test mean? So over time, you can push the team to these habits and routines which help move you towards higher quality code, higher quality tests. But it only gets you to a limited point. Again, if you're, if you're changing behaviors and the team aren't necessarily 100% sold on exactly why they're doing this because it worked before and it's going to be fine, um, then you need to take a few more steps to make it, uh, to, to move the behavior more in the direction you want. So even though we had a champion, even though quality was becoming habitual, even though we had a lot of automated checks now in our continuous integration environment, um, we still had a number of remaining problems. We had, um, I thought I would handwrite these slides just because it got very boring having, uh, having just titles, but probably you can't even read these. So this says, complicated matrix of capabilities. We had this, um, the test suite runs in about six minutes on a MacBook Air. So it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a library code. It's not a massive amount of code. But what we did do is we would run that six minute test suite in all these different combinations. Okay, so we've got three different versions of Java, four different versions of the MongoDB serv um, server. We've got it with authentication turned on, with authentication turned off. We've got SSL, we've got no SSL. We've got single servers, replica sets, and sharded. So we had this very complicated matrix of dependencies. On top of this, we also have a bunch of other stuff here around different types of authentication and other things I can't remember. So there's multiple steps in our build, and for the test step, there's multiple combinations of those tests. So that was quite complicated to maintain. Our tests were largely happy path tests. So this, I believe this comes from writing tests after. We didn't really follow a TDD approach. I couldn't really get us to follow a TDD approach. Um, what happens when you've written the code is that you tend to then write tests to prove the code does what the code does. So if I've written the insert functionality, I write a test to make sure that insert works. I don't necessarily remember to write a test that when the database goes away, insert fails in a particular way. Or if I'm inserting multiple documents that have the same ID, that it fails in the right way. So we had a lot of happy path tests and not a lot of exceptional cases tested. We didn't have any unit tests. Now, this is not enormously problematic because spinning up a MongoDB server is not that expensive. The whole test suite, as I said, took six minutes anyway, so it's a bit longer than I would have liked, but it's not you know, a 40 minute test suite. Um, but I wanted some quick unit tests. I wanted to be able to mock out the server in time, at times. I wanted to be able to test just very small sections of the code without having to test the whole thing end to end and infer the correct behavior here by checking in the database over here. There is value in those tests, but I wanted unit tests as well. Because we didn't have unit tests, because they're integration tests, we had a lot of setup for some of these tests. The server was running, but we need to make sure there's a, the, the, there's a database in there, the right collection is in there, it's set up with the right data. So you have a lot of setup code for testing maybe one or two things. Um, because we had a lot of setup code, often we would have a single test which would test lots of things. I've gone through the effort of setting it up, so now I'll assert this, change this, assert that, change this, all in a single test. Or you go the other way, 
and you have lots of tests, individual tests, which look very similar with slightly different input and output data. We had horrible test names. This is kind of a difficult thing to fix, but um, I'm sure you've all seen tests which are like, you know, test one or test insert, okay? Test what about the insert? What, is it, what should it do? What, it sh what should it not do? Test insert two, test insert three, so on and so forth. I'm not gonna show them to you because it's embarrassing. Um, difficult to see what's under test. This is kind of a result of the other things. We have a lot of setup, so we've got a lot of lines of setup code. Um, we have a lot of, uh, probably a lot of assertions with a lot of different combinations of things. So what's the class I'm actually testing and what behavior am I really trying to test here? Or am I just kind of smooshing together similar-ish functionality and making sure it doesn't go red? This is particularly difficult when you're doing end-to-end -end testing because the test might be, um, test database, in which case you're not really sure which test is on, which class is under test and what the expected behavior is. And because of all of these things, the tests were very hard to read. It was difficult to kind of see what was going on and if it failed, it was difficult to see what should have been happening. So overall, if you want developers to write tests, if you want them to write good tests, it needs to be easy. It can't be difficult. You can't be mocking out your whole framework. You can't be necessarily uh, adopting whole new technologies just to create a unit test. It needs to be as easy as possible to write that automated test so you do it as part of the process and you do it as a habit. And you don't just think, it's gonna take way too much time to write this test so I won't bother. We looked at a bunch of different solutions. These are largely technical solutions. Um, but yeah, well let's go through them quickly. So in order to solve the unit test problem, then obviously we probably need some sort of mocking framework so that we could mock out various bits of the application. We looked at EasyMock, Mockito, JMock. To some extent, some of them are, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, but often setting up your expectations and making sure you verify those expectations was a little bit too much overhead given I want to make it as easy as possible for developers who are unfamiliar with these frameworks to get up and running with writing tests. Similarly, we could have used our own homegrown mocking and stubbing, which is what we did in places. But again, you end up with these, these stubs which have got like loads of implemented methods but don't really do anything. They kind of just add to the complexity of the tests rather than improving the readability of the tests. We could have used Hamcrest matches a lot better. I'm quite keen on Hamcrest matches. I like the fact that you can say something like, my results collection should contain A, or should have one of these things, or should look like this sort of thing. And the fact that I can write custom matches for doing things like matching JSON, that's quite nice too. Um, but Hamcrest is not, I'm kind of used to it now, but I think it probably took me about 12 months to really get used to seeing how Hamcrest matches work, and when they fail, making sure that your custom matches have the correct sort of failure message. So again, then they're, they're not super easy for people who are not comfortable with writing tests to get into immediately. Um, at LMAX, we had quite a lot of success with a DSL for using, uh, for writing our acceptance tests. And this DSL was written in Java, but it was kind of written in a kind of easy to read English style way. So you do, you know, place order, you do create user, you would do all these things. And that was quite nice for creating the high level tests which are readable by our testers and by our business analysts. I thought about this for the Java driver, but our users are Java developers. So I don't need to abstract away the interface with a DSL. I actually want to expose the Java interface and code against it in Java so that when Java developers have a question about what happens if insert fails in this particular way, what happens, what errors should I expect to see, I want to point them to a test in Java which shows them how that should work and how it should fail. So that didn't seem like a good fit for the Java driver. And less around having a technical fix to this, um, this is something that I think Jason Gorman just mentioned, having example code that you can look at that says, this is an example of a good test. This is kind of the shape of how it should be. This is an example of the sort of test we're trying to get away from. And just basically, even just having a wiki saying, good tests in this column, bad tests in this column, follow this style, that probably would have been an, an easier way to train people up on, we're trying to move in this direction, we're trying to move away from these anti-patterns. But it turns out, I went to a conference like this, 
and someone was talking about Spock, which is a Groovy-based BDD-ish um, testing framework. Um, and you can use, even though it's a Groovy testing framework, you can use it to test Java. Now, I'd heard of this before, and I was very anti-it, because, like I said, I want Java developers to be able to read the tests, understand the tests, and I want us to code against the API as if we were Java developers. So I was kind of very anti the idea of using a different JVM language to test our library. It seems like not the right thing to do. However, I went to this talk, and they talked about the pros and cons of Spock, and it fixed a lot of the problems I've just mentioned. And we'll just skip kind of quickly through how it addresses our specific problems. So here's an example Spock test. Um, who's the Java developer here? Or JVM people? Um, C Sharp people? OK, so that's cool. Most of you can kind of read this. Uh, everyone else, ignore the code if you don't care. That's fine. Um, so for Java people, there's some stuff in here which is a little bit unusual. In particular, uh, have I got a pointer? Um, the map syntax here, this is very, a very succinct way of creating a map. For most other languages that are sane, this is fine. But for Java developers, creating maps is a little bit heavy on the boilerplate. Now, in the, in the MongoDB Java driver, what we do is create documents to insert into MongoDB. And these documents look a lot like maps. So we do a lot of this sort of thing. In Java, this is like, I don't know, this many lines of code. Um, so Groovy gives us a succinct way of creating maps. That's nice. It's nice to have. Spock gives us these method names that are strings, which is really weird, because that's actually a method name in a string. Um, the most notable thing about the Spock test is the fact that you have this given when and then structure. And tests have to follow this structure, otherwise it doesn't count as a test. And I quite like that, because I think that forcing yourself to think in terms of what is set up, what is the thing I'm actually trying to test, and what are my assertions, just using just that simplifies your test method and helps you think more clearly around, am I trying to do more than one thing? or which bit's really set up, and which bit is really the thing I'm trying to test. So this, is, this to me, was a very compelling feature of Spock. Uh, what else? Well, those, that's kind of the main uh, overview of what Spock looks like. And you can use this for unit tests, or functional tests, or integration tests, or, or whatever you want. It's kind of a replacement for JUnit. In our particular case, I'm just going to whip through this quite quickly. Um, I found that in terms of addressing our specific issues, I thought Spock made things easier to read just by splitting things up into given, when, and then. We could have done this with JUnit. I could have said, and I've done this with our JUnit tests, I want you to put comments in where you say given, when, and then. I want you to think of the tests in this, in this sense. Um, but having that and having the succinct map syntax, just those two things alone, made our tests much easier to read than they were before. It kind of helps us to potentially address the horrible test names problem because you feel freer to write whatever you want as a test name. You might still be lazy, you might still write test, but um, it allows you to write all sorts of things in there. And you can use cap camel case and capitalization, and um, you use this as documentation. It's a little bit easier for that. You can use things like, obviously, the given when and then helps you separate out what's under, what's the, the setup what's the test criteria, the when, and what are the assertions. But there's also an annotation called subject, which helps you pull out the specific thing you're trying to test. It's just a documentation um, annotation, but it's kind of useful. It's a useful thing to add. Similarly, we are grouping all the setup together in one place, so we know what's set up and what is testing. And then, of course, if our given section gets bigger than, I don't know, maybe three lines of code, then we start thinking we should refactor this into a more reusable method somewhere else. So rather than addressing all of our specific problems around our test smells, it can just help indicate areas where we can make changes. So in this particular case, it just exposes the fact that we have a lot of setup, rather than a single test method where we're not sure whether it's a lot of, a lot of setup or it's a complicated test or a lot of assertions. Here it's quite clear when we have a lot of setup and it needs to be extracted out into something else. Um, Spock makes unit testing very easy. It makes mocking very, very painless. You don't, have to, um, you don't have to make sure you verify the assertions. You just call mock. Um, the dynamic typing makes that mocking stuff much more straightforward. Um, and then at the bottom, you do, I'm expecting one call that looks like this. 
Um, here I've got multiple thens because I want to make sure they get called in order. If I don't care about the order, I just have one then and I just assert that those things just happen. I thought the mocking was very, very painless in Spock, so this was super useful for us. Um, it also makes it very easy to check for exceptions which are thrown or not thrown. In JUnit, for example, you can put the expected exception in the test annotation, but that's kind of weird because it's not down in the assertions where you expect them to be. Or you can have a try with an empty catch block, which is kind of icky as well. Here, you can explicitly state, and it reads like documentation, I really expect to see an illegal argument exception is thrown. Or I expect an illegal argument exception is not thrown. It's much clearer what expectations I have around, um, around exceptional cases. The kind of selling point for us for Spock is that it's got this data-driven testing thing. So each one of those four lines in the where is like a different set of input and output criteria. So I have the same method that I'm calling in my expectation. So I expect collection.find1, but I put different values into my find1 method and I assert different expected IDs. And that's quite nice because then I can kind of run this with, especially as a, a database driver, what we're largely doing is putting in lots of different types of input and asserting lots of different types of output with the same method. Um, so this stopped us having lots of individual tests which look very similar, collapse them into one test where you have lots of inputs and outputs that you're testing. Which means it also solves the testing too many things thing. And I'll show you why in a minute, because you could argue that this has the same problem as JUnit, whereby if the first one of these criteria fails, then we don't really know what the problem is. In actual fact, it runs it as four individual tests. So if one of the sets of inputs or outputs isn't, it doesn't work, it's just that one, the second one down, and it shows you which one failed, what the input was, what the output was. And groovy assertions are really nice as well, so it's much easier to debug what went wrong and where. We, in order to address the complicated matrix of dependencies, you can do this with JUnit and probably a bunch of other frameworks, but we found it just easier to manage in Spock. We can say, don't run it if the server's 3.0 and above. Um, don't run it if the Java version is, is, is version 6. We can do things like do run it under these circumstances, and you annotate each test. So you can tell at each test level um, where, under which circumstances maybe it should or should not run. This is a Java 8 test. This is a Java 6 test. This won't work on old versions of the server because it's a feature that's supported in 3.0 and above only. So it kind of helps document the, the functionality that you're testing, as well as, helping the, as well as helping Jenkins fan it out into the right place. So, um, sorry, I've lost the notes on my, on my thing, so now I don't know where I am. Um, so we did this, we, we chose a brand new JVM technology to test, our, um, to test our application, which is exactly what I didn't want to do. I didn't want a technical solution to what I thought was a process problem. But in actual fact, by providing a technical solution which fixed a bunch of our problems, people started writing a lot more tests. People started writing more tests. They started, um, originally I wanted this just for unit tests, but they started rolling it out for functional tests, integration tests, performance tests, because it was so much easier to write tests in this way. It was so much more readable to find out what the test was supposed to be doing. And the fact that the rest of the team took it upon themselves to roll this out to other areas, to me was a, a massive win. It meant that they'd really embraced this and they liked it and it made things easy for them. I took this screenshot yesterday. So I left MongoDB in December, so it's nearly a year ago, and I can still see that things are, they're still paying attention to quality. They're still making sure that the tests pass. Here, there's um, four, four, sets of, four builds that went red, and unlike in the past, when things went red, it was like, well, someone will fix it, or I'm not really sure what, what went wrong. It might take days to get around to fixing it. Those four commits are all within 20 minutes of each other. So someone was on that straight away, making sure that was fixed. So they're still thinking about quality. They're still, they still have, in fact, the, the coverage percentage, I'm not a big fan of coverage percentage as a metric, but it, it continues to improve. Um, so they're writing more tests, they're writing a range of tests, and they're taking the quality of those tests very seriously. Um, on top of that, tests are being used for a bunch of other things as well, like um, 
there's, and the Java driver is not the only driver for MongoDB. There's like a Ruby one, a Python one, and a Perl one, and all these other different ones. We're starting to write test specifications for new features to go into each of the drivers. So using testing as a, a first class citizen to drive out the design of each of the drivers. So testing is being taken much more seriously than it was before. Remaining issues, right. We don't have a lot of time. This, of course, didn't fix everything. You can't just put in place a new process, a new library, a new language, and expect that to magically fix everything. It did help us a lot more than I expected to, but we still have some problems. Sadly, the performance of Groovy, it's, it gets better and better with every release, but it's not as quick to run as Java. It does take a while to start up an individual Groovy um, test. So when, when I'm running it in my IDE, an individual test takes longer. Like it's seconds, but it's just, it's noticeable. And when you're running it in the whole commit build, you have an extra phase. You've got a phase which is running Java tests, a phase which is running Groovy tests. And that two phases generally is gonna slow you down a bit anyway, plus you, you're running Groovy tests that are a little bit slower. On top of that, Groovy is um, not as predictable in its performance. So we sometimes found the Groovy tests timing out more than the Java tests. So if we had um, a particular a time to meet, if we needed to get responses back quickly, we, we switched to Java tests for that sort of thing. Um, dynamic language is kind of good for testing because if you don't care about types, if you don't care about certain things, it will just let you ignore that stuff. On the other hand, sometimes you have to run the test for it to tell you that you passed in three parameters instead of two. And personally, I like my compiler to tell me that stuff. I don't want to have to run my test to find the stupid stuff that I've done wrong. So dynamic language is, is, a, is a pro and a con for testing. It can help you ignore stuff you really don't care about, but it can slow down your feedback loop where really you want your compiler to say, don't be stupid. Now, instead of having just a whole suite of tests which are a, a little bit inconsistent, we also have inconsistent old tests, nice new Java tests, nice new Groovy tests. And we have Groovy tests as unit tests and as functional tests. So we've actually introduced more inconsistency across the board, which is not really ideal, but the cost of maintaining those different types, I think is worth paying given that we have more tests and we have more security that our code is doing what we think it's doing. If we start touching the old test cases, then um, um, we're migrating them to Groovy. So we're gradually going to do that. But I have no intention of changing all of the Java tests to Groovy tests because it's a, it's a lot of work. And if the tests work, don't touch them. It's fine. Um, unclear test type responsibilities. Um, there are lots of different types of tests, as you know. There's performance tests, unit tests, functional tests, acceptance tests. And when you talk about functional tests or integration tests, they mean different things to different people. And we still suffer from that at, in the Java driver. There's still functional tests which require the server running, unit tests which don't need the server running, unit tests which test more than one class. And um, I was trying to introduce this idea of acceptance tests, which are um, full end-to-end -end running tests. But it was still unclear which tests we're supposed to be writing for under which circumstances. I originally thought that Groovy would help with this by saying unit tests are Groovy tests. Functional tests or acceptance tests will be Java tests because we want Java developers to read the Java tests and understand how to use the, the Java API from, a Java, from Java code. And I was hoping for that clear separation, but we didn't get that. So obviously, there's still some more to be done around quality in, uh, in the particular case of the MongoDB Java driver. So coming back to the original questions, how can we encourage the team to write tests full stop of any kind? We found that, well, I found in the past that pairing, we didn't do this in MongoDB because we're a distributed team. But pairing is a really, really good way to keep yourself honest to make sure that you write tests. Code reviews were a good way for us to make sure that we were kept honest and made sure that not only did we have tests, but they tested um, happy path and exceptional cases and were good at identifying places where we could write more tests. Um, but the thing that we found most useful to encourage developers to write tests is make it as easy as possible. Make it simple, make it easy, 
Make it fun if possible, like playing with Groovy was actually quite fun. I'm not really one of those developers who likes to play with a new language because like, it just takes me ages to learn stuff. So it wasn't, for me it wasn't a massive incentive, but I did find it fun learning how Groovy was going to simplify things for us. So make it fun, make it easy, make it part of the process. How do we write readable tests? In our case, we found that Groovy and the Spock framework helped us a lot with this. They helped us because we um, had a more succinct syntax for doing things that we did com in a common way, like um, creating maps. We had the given when and then. We had those nice um, textual method names. So w the framework gave us a lot of pointers on how we could write more readable tests. The, but Spock and Groovy are not the only, the only thing you can do. You can write your own DSL for making more readable tests. You can use, there's a framework called Gwen, which I think was open sourced by Shazam, which is another given when and then framework for JUnit, I think. Um, even just writing comments with given when and then, or whatever, however you want to structure your, your tests, writing comments can actually help. I know comments is a, is a, a discussion topic. Um, and make it clear, the reason why I'm kind of big about this given when and then is that it helps to make it clear what is set up, what's the thing you're really trying to test, and what are the things that you're trying to assert. And it helps you see where maybe you have too many assertions or too much setup, or if you're not clear what you're testing, then perhaps you shouldn't be writing that test. So um, just the given when and then framework helps with that. So finally, how can we write meaningful tests? This is obviously much more difficult and difficult to automate because I'm the one who needs to read it and understand if this test is useful, if it means anything to me, whereas the computer will just read it and run it. So this is the most difficult thing to go for. So um, obviously you can use things like code reviews so that if I can understand your test, then it has some sort of meaning, but it's not just readable. Um, but understanding the purpose of the test will help you write more meaningful tests. If it's a unit test, it needs to test just that class, or it needs to test the responsibilities of that class and perhaps provide mocks. If it's an acceptance test, it should be documenting the specific behavior that we're expecting. Um, so understanding the sort of tests we're, tr we're trying to write and the responsibilities of those tests is, uh, is kind of key to writing meaningful tests. So I'm going to whip quickly through the conclusions. Maybe we'll have time for some questions, maybe not. Um, usually conclusions come in threes. I've got like six because I had lots of conclusions. But the conclusion is, if you want people to write good quality tests, make it as easy as possible. It doesn't have to be introducing a brand new framework like we did, but it, it might be as simple as just trying to provide some examples of what you mean by a good quality test. But make it as easy as possible for people to do this. Automate everything, especially the boring stuff. So have check style and PMD and find bugs or whatever the equivalent is in your language. Um, automate inspections. You shouldn't be looking at any of that stuff that a computer can check. You should be looking at the meaningfulness of a test rather than is your curly brace in the right place. Make sure all of that stuff is running continuous integration. Have zero tolerance for failures. Once Jenkins starts going red and people start piling more commits in, you have no idea what failed, what's now failing that wasn't failing before, what the root cause is. As soon as you have a failure, fix it or roll it back. That's the only way to make sure that you continue to have quality. And it's the only way to make sure that everyone knows that it's unacceptable for there to be like, oh, it's gone red again, never mind. You have to keep it green all the time. Preferably have a champion, someone, it doesn't have to be someone high up in the organization, but someone who keeps people honest and keeps poking people to say, have you written a test? Does this test mean anything to you? Just someone who can kind of keep, um, keep the energy going in this direction. Um, it's kind of exhausting, but if you care about quality, it's something to, uh, it's, it's worth doing. And you can rotate that champion. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have a big enough team or if you're lucky enough to have a bunch of people who are interested, when you get bored of poking people, you could say to someone else, could you like, keep an eye on quality for the next like, week or whatever? Um, if you are the champion, though, don't get like, super religious about everything. There are some fights I just had to give up. I really wanted us to do TDD. I wanted us to write our tests first. I wanted us to write unit tests. And I wanted us to have acceptance tests. And I never was very good at articulating the benefits of those things, so I never managed to sell the rest of the team on that stuff. 
And either I was going to have to like do all of that stuff myself or just accept the fact that I was just going to have to take the wins that I could get. I helped us improve the quality of our code. I helped us improve the quality of our tests. That's good. The fact they're not writing the tests first, well, we're still doing better than we were doing before. Um, pairing or code review is a really good way to make sure that your test quality is good because it's very easy to write a test that goes green. It's not so easy to write a test which is, which is meaningful and really does what it's supposed to be doing. And pairing a code review is, is the way that needs an, a manual human pair of eyes on it to do that. And keep in mind the purpose of testing. Are we trying to test end to end? Are we writing a test which is going to document behavior for someone else to read? Are we writing a unit test? In which case, I think um, class level unit tests are great for things like testing a specific calculation or something very um, specific to that class. So that will help you feel more directed on what you're writing in terms of that individual test. Um, I apparently am out of time, but um, if you have any questions, come and grab me anytime over the next couple of hours while I'm still here. Thank you very much.